I must admit that I am really won over with the charm of this model. It is definitely a beauty to behold. A big hello to you. I hope I find you well. It is so great to see you. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Jenny Kirk, welcoming you up here to Weir Yard. And today we're going to be taking a look at an all new special commission that's come as partnership between Locomotion Models, Rails of Sheffield, and Hellion as well. And it's quite a quirky little prototype. Harking back to the dawn of the electric locomotive, this steeple cab little beauty is one which, if one example hadn't been preserved in the National Collection, I suspect it would have been more of a footnote of the pioneering electric traction that was being experimented with at the time. But one did survive and has been commissioned as a ready-to-run model from that trio. And today we're going to be taking a good close look at the Northeastern Railway ES1. Is it something that you should have in your collection? Well, come with me and let's take a closer look in association with Trainomatic makers of DCC decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts with the full range available to browse and buy today at tramfabrique.co.uk. And don't forget that we'll be doing a full DCC fitting guide on this locomotive, making use of the Trainomatic Next 18 decoder, and that's towards the final third of this video. Additional support comes from Rails of Sheffield. Sell to the name you know and trust. Buy, sell or exchange, any age or any gauge. Call them now for the very best price. Check them out today at the link below. I have to say that this locomotive out of the box really does look a beauty, uh, but does it mechanically and otherwise live up to expectations? Well, that's what today's video is all about. So come with me and we'll take a closer look. Rails of Sheffield have been quite prolific in terms of the items that they've been commissioning and uh, they've included items of rolling stock and locomotives, a lot of which might never have otherwise been seen ready to run. And they've partnered on this with a number of different manufacturers and this particular one, the Northeastern Railway ES1, ES standing for Electric Shunting Locomotive, is the most recent to be released. There are a number of different livery options available which chart the original locomotives from the Northeastern Railway origins through the LNER and into later BR use. And this particular example that I have uh, purchased from Rails of Sheffield is catalogue number 1204 in the BR Late Crest lined green as number 26500. And this for me is the most eye-catching of the liveries available and the original Northeastern Railway liveries are available exclusively through locomotion models with the rest of the liveries through Rails of Sheffield and we do have a link in the description box down below to help you find this model and all the other different livery options. Later on in the video we're also going to be doing a full DCC fitting guide utilising the Trainomatic Next 18 DCC decoder. So if you've come for that then that will be towards the final third of the video. We've also got promised interior lights and directional lights and this is sound ready as well. They do do some sound fitted options too which um, would be quite interesting. The real locomotives, there were two of them, were originally built by the Northeastern Railway for the uh, Newcastle Quayside branch, which ran from Trafalgar Yard near Manners Station down through quite a steeply graded and heavily curved line that ran through a couple of tunnels down to the Newcastle Quays. 
And the reason for going electric was simply because the Northeastern Railway had been running it using steam locomotives. And quite frankly, that had been a nightmare through steeply graded tunnels with poor ventilation. And that had caused a lot of issues for the locomotive crews. Although, ironically, even though they had complained vociferously about this, when the electric locomotives were introduced, the complaints merely changed to such things as why was there no means for them to keep their tea warm? Uh, but, um, you know, you can never really seem to please all the people all the time. The box is nice and substantial with a line art drawing of the locomotive on the top and the green colour actually does make it stand out really, really well. Hellion, of course, partnered with Rails more recently too for the Northeastern Railway petrol electric rail car, which really was a superb model. Now, as always with Hellion models, we get this uh, nice booklet, something that Hellion do do quite well. And tucked away inside, we do have a little warning for when we come to take the body off. So we will pay attention to that uh, as part of the DCC fitting. Inside, we've got actually quite a good uh, overview of the history of the locomotives. And it really was quite a short line, very steep, 1 in 27, dropping 130 feet to the quayside in less than one mile, featuring deep cuttings and a claustrophobic tunnel situated on a sharp curve. The locomotives themselves, there was two of them, and one of them was ultimately claimed for the National Collection and can still be seen at the Railway Museum. And more interesting, some of the flame-cut panels from the scrapped sister recently reappeared unexpectedly in a pub garden. Uh, so um, it is quite interesting that some of the relics do still turn up. They were superseded at the point that they were up for renewal by diesel shunters, which were by then able to just as easily handle the workload without any great expense in renewing the infrastructure. We've got a full parts list in here, actually a very extensive parts list, and it just shows what goes into making these models. And then we've got uh, some detail on servicing and DCC fitting information. So we're going to be looking over that when it comes to DCC fit the model. The model itself is contained within quite a typical clam-shaped uh, packaging inside some quite good protective foam. Just be a little bit careful where you pick the model up from, because there are a lot of uh, quite delicate handrails on this. We also get a little detail bag too. We have these three link couplings. They feel like they're made of metal. And I do believe that these are really an either or with the NEM couplings here with the tension locks, because these will interfere with those, but they are provided for the user to fit and they do look to be fully functional certainly with that metal construction these are strong enough to be used as couplings if you want to go down the three link route first impressions of the model are that there is a great deal of weight in these even though it's quite a small model and with this steeple cab arrangement with the sloped bonnets front and back, there's not a huge amount of uh, immediately apparent space inside. The side uh, ladder kind of isn't very well attached. It is something, unfortunately, I've had with a few Hellion models that they are very stingy with the glue at the factory. So Hellion, when you watch this, do please feed that back. And I can see that the one on the other side is pretty much loose as well. So I'm just going to have to stop the video a moment and I'm going to glue that back on. The rest of the model does feel reasonably secure. I'm just giving a good uh, fumble around all the bogies and the rest of the uh, railings and handrails do seem to be pretty reasonably attached. The pantograph on the roof, which is modelled on the slightly later design that the locomotives acquired fairly early on, as it turned out that the bow collectors that they were originally fitted with weren't quite up to the job, is this is really quite nice. It just flicks upwards and naturally it goes to pretty much the peak of the travel. 
So certainly if you've got overhead lines, this will quite happily just follow them. Although I think for most people, rule one applies and just leave the pantograph in the lowered position. It's fully sprung and it's an all metal construction. Although the head does seem to have a little bit of a sideways droop. It's something that I've noticed quite a bit with pantographs on models. It's very hard to get these to sit level. But certainly that is one of the better pantographs that I've seen in model form. And Hellion do have to be commended for being able to model that in a poseable position. And uh, they could easily have got away with just having that as a decorative fixed item in the lower position just pushing that down it clips into place quite readily actually quite nicely but they have gone for the fully working pantograph and i really do like that and it does seem quite strong as well we've got these lights fitted front and back on the bonnets as per the prototype and this lining really is exquisite i can see that this and the northeastern railway liveried versions are definitely going to be the most popular quite least because this is an absolutely beautiful livery and that lining really does pick out the shape of the side panels so so well this is also the livery which it was in when I saw it at uh, Shildon, I believe it was at, uh, a number of years ago. And certainly I think that this is going to prove one of the most popular of the livery options. Looking to the cab sides, the printing on that uh, crest really is incredible. And with the camera that I'm using to film this, I can't quite get in close, but certainly... There's no fuzziness on what I see, and I'm really interested to see that up really, really close and personal. The number is crisp and clean, and then we've got the British Railways ferret and dartboard there on the other side. That is, in fact, the panel which Flame Cut from the sister locomotive was recently discovered tucked away behind a shed in a uh, beer garden of a pub, which uh, was quite an amazing find. The cab detail does look to be in there and uh, it'd be interesting to see that with the cab lighting on to see just what we've got inside. The cab roof does have a really heavy duty feel to it. I think that's actually metal so we get a nice scale thickness but at the same time it really does, it feels like uh, the real deal. I think that is metal and that is actually that works really really well um, I must admit that that is a great effect for getting that kind of thin metal plate effect and certainly the paint really uh, sets that off well I've said this before in reviews that uh, painted metal is so much more authentic than painted plastic even if it's the same paints used there's something about the finish that you get of uh, paint on metal that really does look amazing. Looking to the underside, we've got these chains fitted, and these are actually chain links. The, the detail in the underframe really is amazing. Just looking at underneath, there is a lot of metal parts on here, and those that are not uh, die cast are etched, it would seem. Certainly, the steps, from what I can see, are made up of etched metal pieces and we've even got the checker plate on the treads too. The rivet detail is perfectly captured and uh, even though some of the smaller pipe work on the side is part of the moulding it doesn't detract at all from the overall model and I have to say that this has captured the look of the ES1 perfectly. We've got these heavy duty bogies captured realistically we've got all that rivet detail on the heavy plate frames and then we've also got the third rail shoe current collectors along the side as well these are on both sides so that the locomotive could run either way round and i'm sure it did have a uh, number one and number two end uh, but i'm not entirely sure just looking at it which end would be which it's also interesting to see that the overhead warning flashes made it to this locomotive. I suppose 
it does make sense, even though this is a locomotive very much of a different age. The glazing on the windows is very, very well done. We've got flush glazing. Uh, there is a little bit of a thickness visible if you go looking for it, but certainly that is quite a nice effect. And they're nicely picked out around the edges in the black. The buffer beams on the original locomotive, I believe, were wood. And I have seen a photograph of one of them removed. But the representation here on the model really is good with sprung buffers. And I do particularly like the uh, actual shanks in there that uh, are painted in the... Uh, we've got this kind of metallic gun metal. And it really does look like the real buffers did where you've got that slightly shiny plunger going back in with the springs contained within. We've got metal lamp irons, three at each end. Personally, I would have preferred the drawbar hook to be fitted without the three link. I think that that would much improve the appearance. And certainly for the number of modelers who are going to use that three link coupling, I think that modelers in general would be better served by having the hook in the buffer beam from the factory without the three link coupling, maybe having that as something that can be fitted if the user so wants. Although I do understand why they've gone this route and it's probably not too difficult to clip off the three link part of those separate couplings and just fit the coupling hook in there if uh, the lack of it does bother. We've got these guard irons and these feel like these are springy plastic possibly i'm not sure but certainly they have captured the slender look of the originals perfectly and we've got more of that very very fine blackened chain just as per the prototype couplings are slimline tension locks which fit into a nem pocket and the mounting for these is actually quite unobtrusive hidden right back here so you can either use uh, the couplings of your choice or completely remove it and there's nothing which is going to look ugly and weird. We appear to have all wheel pickup and all wheel drive and you can see there we've got gearing in the base of these bogies with access hatches for application of a small amount of oil should maintenance become necessary. Running on DC it ran faultlessly straight out of the box. As you can see, the cab light and the light in the direction of travel comes on automatically on DC. When I change direction, the cab light also comes on, but now the light on the rear is extinguished. There appears to be no tail lamps on the model, certainly not on DC. But running out of the box is pretty good, and uh, this is with no running in. It is quite happy on the DCC Concepts Rolling Road. One thing that I can see here is that we've got a fully detailed cab interior, and the cab lighting really does set that off well. The only area where I could fault it is you can see the wire going up to the lighting at the roof level. On DC, the model ran flawlessly out of the box, and I was actually really quite impressed with it. You will always have the cab light on and the light in the direction of travel. There's no way to actually turn this off on DC, although it's not really too much of a problem. Unlike a lot of other models that we've seen recently, there's no dip switches for the control of these. But actually, I don't think it needs it, and they would just add complexity, which this model doesn't need. On DCC though, using the Trainomatic Next18 decoder or another compatible decoder, we are able to control those lights. And I'm going to show you the DCC fitting process next. But be warned, the manual for this model misses out a couple of very important steps, which you do need to pay attention to, to be able to safely DCC fit it. First of all, I've prepared a servicing cradle and I've cut some foam blocks to be able to support the locomotive whilst it's upside down. The reason for this is if you just put this straight in, it's going to have all of its weight on this quite delicate pantograph and I'm looking to avoid that. So by cutting those blocks and pre-fitting them, we've got a means to rest the locomotive on those and not on the pantograph. This is now where the instructions 
really lack an important step. There are four screws to be able to get the body off and they're hidden away underneath the edges of the bogies, which means you cannot access them without going through an extra step which the manual mentions nothing about. And that is that these current collection bars are going to need to come off. They appear to be push fit, but without any information in the instructions, this might be a little bit of a daunting thing to do. And even with a great deal of care, just got to prise these off. As you can see there, we've got two lugs that are a push fit, and that's what we're gently sliding out. All four of these are going to have to come off to be able to gain access to those screws. Once you know that these come off, it is quite easy to just lever them out with a small flathead jeweler's screwdriver. Just be careful that you don't lose these to the carpet gods. Once those are off, we need to change up to a crosshead screwdriver. I'm just going to pick a small one of these. And we can now gain access to those four body screws and undo them. They're still quite restricted, so just take it very carefully and avoid scrubbing the bogey sides with the screwdriver. Once we've got those four screws undone, they appear to be uh, all but impossible to slide out with the bogies in place. So just be a bit careful at this point that when you turn all this the other way up, that those screws don't go missing. So I'm just going to lift it up, move the cradle out of the way for now. Right side up and just gently and carefully separate the body from the chassis. Inside you can see that the lighting does feature some quite innovative spring-loaded plungers, so we don't have to be too worried about wires and plugs which could conceivably become damaged. It's a really interesting construction and we can see all of the cab interior detail quite readily, plus the lighting in the roof. Tucked away inside, we do have a little warning for when we come to take the body off. One thing to watch at this stage is that these metal boards are just a loose fit. If you're not prepared for it, it'd be very easy to lose these. They just rest in place, as you can see there. Make sure that they're back in when you reassemble the model. They just sit on the running plate We've got some really nice detail inside the cab and this is a great opportunity to be able to fit a crew if you so wish. This here is the blanking plate for the next 18 socket and we also have an enclosure where you can fit a small speaker if you wish to sound fit the model. Just very very carefully lever up and off the blanking plate. You can get rid of that and then with next 18, it's a really simple process. Make sure that the decoder is lined up the same way that the blanking plate was, and it just clicks into place. And I just feel there, that feels okay. I am gonna now test this on the programming track before I put the body back on, just to make sure that all is well. And that is a good procedure to follow. A quick test on the programming track confirms that the model is okay, the DCC fit is successful. I've been able to read back the decoder, reprogramming it with the number that I want for this locomotive. And then it's simply a case now to reverse the process and put the model back together. So we just make sure that these metal strips are placed back into the right location. This can be just a little bit fiddly. Once we're happy that they're in, we're then just going to drop the body back into place. Should just slide down and that will capture those running boards where they need to go. Now we can safely turn it over, put it back into the servicing cradle 
and reverse the whole process, tightening up those screws, making sure that any that dropped free when we inverted the model can be returned into place and tightened up. The next job is to reattach these pickup shoe collectors. Make sure that you've got them the right way round and the right way up and they just push fit back into the axle boxes. These are handed and just make sure that you get them the right way round. If you're worried about these coming loose you could always put a small dab of glue just to make sure all is well. And that's all there is to it. With the locomotive DCC fitted, I've moved it over to the main wear yard layout. And first of all, I want to test on the lighting. On F0, these are directional and illuminate in the direction of the locomotive's travel. And you can see that it's actually a really, really bright light. This is perfectly in keeping with the prototype. These weren't marker lights. It was actually all about the locomotive crew being able to see the way. And I guess as well as a fringe benefit of that, when the locomotive emerged down onto the dock side, it gave ample warning to anybody moving around on the inset track in the area that there was a train coming. It also served to allow the crew to see where they needed to change over from the third rail electric to the overhead current collection and vice versa. So really important that these were quite bright and it would have been most likely something like an electric arc light or a very, very powerful tungsten filament type bulb. One thing's for certain, you wouldn't have wanted to have been looking straight into that light from in front of the locomotive. When I change the direction of travel of the locomotive, it's got that very, very pleasing fade in and fade out. And of course, being modelled on pre-LED lighting, it would have done just that. Turning the headlights off on F0, we can also activate them permanently on or off using F1 and F2. In this way, it's actually possible to get both of the headlights on at the same time, although this probably isn't very prototypical. The cab light is contained on F3 and it's quite good that Hellion have made use of more of the lighting functions on this. I think the cab light really is a great effect. It shows off that very large spacious cab interior really well and I can well see the ease of fitting a crew when you've got the body off would make this a real ideal opportunity for some degree of customization for the modeler. Overall, really pleased with the lighting functions that are available on this model. When it comes to getting the locomotive moving, let's just bear in mind that I didn't fit any stay alive into this model. So on speed steps 5, 6, we've just moved up to there, it is capable of quite a pleasing smooth crawl. The acceleration is smooth and none of the CVs have been changed on this model. Changing direction as well, it decelerates, stops and then accelerates in the opposite direction. Given that there is no stay alive function in this locomotive, it really does seem to be untroubled by any of the dirty track on this rarely used piece of weir yard. The directional lighting works just fine and I actually really do like that quite bright front light. Certainly you can imagine this locomotive emerging from tunnels and you see it coming long before you see the locomotive itself. I do like the function. Whilst they probably wouldn't have trundled around with the cab light on as well, you can see too that if we illuminate the cab light, then it doesn't automatically go off when the locomotive moves. But to be honest, that's not really a problem. The locomotive handled all of the point work that I set it through perfectly well. It crested the peaks and troughs of the gradients on the torture test track and even managed to get round a radius one curve with no issues whatsoever. When I moved it over to the main running line, it again performed faultlessly. Here I taxed it with an exceptionally long train of brake vans and these do have quite some rolling resistance because of the number of wheels on the track. 
And it actually handled this really well, getting it over the crest of the gradient on the main line just about, with a degree of wheel slipping, but it did keep on going. And that train is far longer than the prototype would have ever been tasked with. So really, on the average layout, you're not going to be disappointed with the performance of this locomotive. So I turn now to the scores. First up is build quality. And overall, the handrails and such like are very well attached. And I was particularly impressed by this quite slender metal parts and springs pantograph, which is fully functional in terms of being able to pose it up or down. It uh, didn't really pose any problems, although I was a little bit cautious getting it unsprung. I think for most modelers, you're going to have it in the fixed down position, but that's not really a problem. The fact that Hellion and Ray have modelled this fully functional and poseable really is exceptional and I was very impressed with that. The lighting too has been absolutely faultless on this model and other than the cab steps which seemed very very prone to coming off and even now do feel a little bit on the loose side with one of them requiring some additional glue to get it fixed back in place. Everything else on the model did seem pretty secure. So I'm going to give this a 9.5 out of 10. On running quality, I simply can't fault anything. There's no stay alive fitted to this locomotive, and yet there was absolutely nothing on Weir Yard that phased it. It got through all of the point work, both Electrofrog and Inselfrog, and there was no sign of stuttering. And one of the telltales that would normally be of a locomotive on the edge of current collection of flickering lights did not plague this locomotive in the slightest. So with nothing to adjust out of the box, I couldn't be more pleased with its running quality. It handled the torture test track, including some quite severe gradients and all of the point work that Weir Yard could throw at it, including that test train of brake vans, which it just managed to crest over the peak of the gradient. So I'm going to give this 10 out of 10. On DCC fitting and innovation, well, the innovation side is really good. I do like the lighting and it is particularly pleasing to see that cab all lit up inside and those quite powerful front and rear lights too are just as per what you would have expected from the prototype. The next 18 socket also ensures that there's no issues trying to fit in a decoder. They'll just fit and that's one of the beauties of the next 18 socket. Provision 2 is provided for a sound fitted option and whilst I might have mentioned at the beginning of the uh, video that sound options are available I've actually when going back I can't find any so it does have provision for you to fit your own sound file but from rails or locomotion models there are not factory fitted sound options. Nonetheless Hellion and rails have made it very very easy to fit your own sound decoder and with a speaker that just needs to be dropped into the enclosure, it couldn't be easier. However, one area where I felt was a little bit disappointing was that the instructions make no mention to the need to take off these third rail pickup bars on the side of the bogies. It just says undo the screws, remove the body, but that extra step is vitally important. And whilst I'm fairly confident around these locomotives in being able to pull parts off and get it apart, I know an awful lot of modelers would be all lost at sea. And it does seem to have been an easy win that has been missed by Hellion by not including that step in the instructions. They are just push fit. But when you've spent £220 on a model, it can be a little bit nerve-wracking going a little bit off-piste to pull parts off on spec, just in case that's what you need to do to actually get it DCC fitted. So that was probably the only disappointment in this area. So I'm going to give it 8.9 out of 10. On accuracy and quality of finish, there really isn't anything that I can fault with this model. It really is a superb rendition of this light green livery with all the lining straight and true, even where it crosses some of the detail. The interior of the cab as well is pleasingly detailed, with the only real drawback being the wire that goes up the side, but these could quite easily be hidden with a crew. 
The pantograph is a work of art and I also really do like this thin metal roof that perfectly mimics the prototype. All in all, there's not really anything of note to fault on this and given the attention to detail with the buffer shanks being coloured in that gunmetal silver and everything else about this, that crest on the side is a work of art. I'm going to give this 10 out of 10. Next up is value for money. The model costs £220, which is in the ballpark for a specially commissioned model. There are a lot of features on this model, but it is quite a niche prototype, and that probably explains some of the higher than normal price. It would be quite a gamble to estimate how many people were going to buy this beautiful little model. It does have quirkiness, but given its limited geographical sphere of operations, it has to be said that if one hadn't been preserved in the National Collection, they would probably have been very much an obscure footnote in railway history. So Hellion and Rails do have to be congratulated for bringing this to market. And I'm going to give this an 8.5 out of 10. And that gives us a very, very respectable 46.9 out of 50 as our total for the Hellion ES1. I must admit that I am really won over with the charm of this model. It is definitely a beauty to behold and one which I'll probably be running far outside its prototypical geographical sphere on my layout. I think that it really does capture the spirit of those early electric pioneer locomotives and I really would look forward to seeing whether they could be persuaded to release her sister locomotive, the long scrapped number two, as I think that there is definitely a market for these quirky oddball locomotives and I'm very pleased to have added this to my collection. Well, I hope you really enjoyed today's video and found it informative and I'd love to hear from you in the comments section down below if this is perhaps a locomotive that you've already got in your collection. I'd love to hear about your experiences of it or maybe it's a locomotive that you've watched today's video and really like the look of and if that is the case I'd love to hear from you and don't forget that we've got an affiliate link in the description box down below that takes you to Rails of Sheffield where you can pick up the model scene in today's video and also the other livery options that they have available and they cater from the LNER Black through the BR Black and to the really quite eye-catching Northeastern Railway Green with BR Insignia that you saw on the model in this video. For the Northeastern Railway version, Locomotion Models has that exclusively and you can find it from their shop along with all of their special commissions as well. Don't forget too that you can check out our merch store down below. We've got plenty of merchandise from t-shirts to hoodies to mugs, everything that you might possibly want for your JK merchandise branded goodness. And we've got a link to for that Monday Club Wagon Special Commission, which indeed should be imminent in the next month or so, we're hoping, fingers crossed. You can also head on over to Patreon and we've got a number of different tiers of rewards to cater for every pocket to help support the channel to keep making the videos that you want to see and you can also become a channel member as well for all those great perks in the Monday Club chat as well as early access to the Friday video that Patreons also get as well but until next time this is me Jenny Kirk saying you take great care of yourself happy modeling bye for now today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. Additional support comes from Rails of Sheffield. Sell to the name you know and trust. Family-run business purchasing collections for over 50 years. From single items to lifetime collections, no collection is too small or too big. Buy, sell or exchange, any age or any gauge. Rails will take everything locos, coaches, wagons, track work, controllers, accessories. In fact, they will take absolutely everything and certainly will not cherry pick the best items. Rails are only a phone call away. Call them now for the very best price and get instant cash payment or same day transfer. Check them out today at the link below.
I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Offshore Allen, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Botterini, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, John N. from NC, NYM Arish, Jonathan Foster, Peter, Clifford Ison, Larry W. Grant, NI Railways 4000 Class, Ian Coulson, Alan Dickerson, Eddie Papair, Karen Nicholl, Medwin Williams, Crossways Point Junction, 3B Rail, Jennifer Horton, and James Beckett. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.